settlement rugged shores inhabited surf pounded littered shoals threaten Let us turn our attention to the time of the Vikings more than a thousand years ago. On the other side of the world there were two large islands where at this point of time no man had set foot on. These islands cover an area the size of Great Britain. They were made up of many high snow-covered mountains and lower down most areas were covered with huge forests whose trees were totally unlike those found in the Europe of the Vikings. In some parts there were active smoking volcanoes, in other parts steaming geysers often with boiling water being pushed high into the air. or pools of boiling mud, bubbling like porridge. The ocean waves along the coastline were crashing onto rugged rocky shores, often inhabited by hundreds of seals or penguins and many other seabirds. Along other parts of the coastline, the surf pounded onto stretches of beach, often littered with driftwood, which rivers had brought down from the forests. Out at sea, dolphins and whales could be seen feeding off the large shoals of fish. The forests were alive with many different kinds of birds, a number of which could hardly fly. The kiwi, which is a night bird, has no wings at all, but then there were no dangerous animals to threaten it. In open flat areas one could have seen huge birds which looked like ostriches but two or three times as tall. They were called mowers. Polynesian from the Pacific Islands such as Hawaii and Tahiti performed indigenous Taiwanese Tribal Hierarchy Fortified Protection Warfare Honor Protrude the tongue Intimidate Exercise Combat These Polynesian people who came to New Zealand about 1,000 years ago are called Maoris. Their mythology and legends told from one generation to the next tells about the landing of six canoes which today forms the basis of the six main tribes. Uh, some people say we came from the islands of Tahiti Others say the islands of Hawaii, um, but even before that, scientists go back and say that we came from Southeast Asia. In 1997, they performed uh, genetic testing, and they say genetically we are most similar uh, Polynesian people 
most similar to the indigenous Taiwanese. They ended up living in different parts of this country, where there was plenty of food for them. Birds and berries in the forest, as well as shellfish and fish from the sea and rivers. With time, their numbers increased and they formed sub-tribes. They developed a tribal hierarchy with chiefs and priests. The Maori tribes ended up living in fortified villages on tops of hills for protection from other tribes. The Maori way of life became more centered on tribal warfare. Tribes or sub-tribes attacked each other either over matters of territories or honor. There was also a certain amount of cannibalism. The haka was a dance where the men stamped their, uh, stamped their feet and beat their thighs and protrude the tongue. And what they tried to do is look very intimidating, very scary. Long ago, the haka was used as an exercise before battle uh, to intimidate their enemy and scare them away and also to prepare the warriors for physical combat. In the haka, they enlarge the eyes, make their faces very ugly, turn down the corners of the mouth. Like, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> See a lot of that last time. <laughs> Dutch, explorer, discovered, sighted, crew. It was not until 1642 that the Maoris met the first European. He was the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman, who had sailed from the Dutch colony, today known as Indonesia, to look for a sea route to South America. Tasman first discovered what today is known as Tasmania and sailed further east across the sea between Australia and New Zealand, now called the Tasman Sea. Tasman sighted the west coast of the South Island of New Zealand and when wanting to go into land in what today is known as Golden Bay, a group of Maoris in canoes killed three of his crew. This ended in him deciding to sail northwards without ever setting foot on New Zealand. 137 years passed before the English explorer, Captain James Cook, rediscovered New Zealand. Because he had spent some time in Tahiti and learnt their language, Cook was able to use it to communicate with the Maoris, whose language was similar. Cook used considerable time sailing around New Zealand and made a good map of this country. Lawlessness Signing Treaty Cornerstone Coexistence Since then Many Europeans arrived. First came whalers and sealers, followed by missionaries and traders. Lawlessness developed, making the British, under Queen Victoria, decide to arrange for the signing of a treaty between the British and the Maoris in 1840. New Zealand became a British colony. Today, the Treaty of Waitangi forms the cornerstone for relatively good coexistence between Māori and Europeans, although the first hundred years were not without problems.
Single Story, Capital City, Frequent, Suburb, Influenced. In today's New Zealand, by far the greatest number of people live in the towns and cities. Most own a single-storied house or bungalow with a garden. This means that the cities are very spread out and that Auckland, with one million people, takes up an area the size of Greater London. Wellington is New Zealand's capital city with a population of 350,000 people when you include its satellite cities. It has been built on a natural harbour and is geographically near the centre of New Zealand. It is usually called Windy Wellington because of the frequent winds that blow through Cook Strait. Only one third of New Zealanders live in the South Island. In Christchurch and its suburbs there are 340,000 people, making it the South Island's largest city. The central city is strongly influenced by English Gothic architecture, where public buildings are made of stone. However, most New Zealand houses are made of wood, and we have a good example here. The Anglican Church, also known as the Church of England, is the largest. Because many New Zealanders have their roots in Ireland, there are also many Roman Catholics. Then there are also other Christian sects, such as Presbyterians, also known as the Church of Scotland, Methodists, Baptists and the Salvation Army. Not surprisingly, New Zealand's culture is greatly influenced by Britain and the rest of Europe. Here is a free open-air concert in Christchurch, which attracted 60,000 people. Ancestors Revive Wood carving Most Māoris today have European ancestors. Even some, with one sixteenth Māori or less, consider themselves as Māori. In their day-to-day -day living, they live like Europeans, but many are reviving their traditional culture, mixed with a European, both in music and art. Here a young Māori is learning wood carving. His face and hands have been tattooed. Here too the design is a mixture of traditional and modern. Participate. Favourable. Outdoor pursuits. New Zealanders love their sport. Every weekend, hundreds of thousands are actively participating. Those sports originating from Britain dominate. Here we see netball on a Saturday, with all ages participating. Netball is like basketball without dribbling, mostly played by girls and women. Rugby is very popular, and even Super 12 league matches, like this one, can easily attract 20,000 spectators. While international matches are always sold out. Touch rugby is a simplified form of rugby and is often played socially. Cricket is very popular in the summer and is being played more and more by women. The old English game of bowls is played by thousands of elderly people. 
When you bowl the ball, it curves because it is heavier on the one side. The idea is similar to petang. Not surprisingly, golf is popular too and is being played both in the cities and in the country. Mountains, forests, waterfalls and rivers, together with a favourable climate, make New Zealand an attractive place for many outdoor pursuits. Hiking, which New Zealanders call tramping, is a very popular pastime. So are kayaking, canoeing, white river rafting, boating and sailing. For those who look for more adrenaline-packed activities, there is jet boating. The principle of a jet boat was developed by a New Zealander in the 1950s. These boats, once over a certain speed, can sail safely in water only 15 centimetres deep. The boat is up to here, that's the normal water level when we're sitting in the water. Then it's lifting right off the bottom here, and that's right out of the water. Okay, when it's going fast. This activity needs no introduction. Even older people love to throw themselves out. Alright, that's the pipeline 102 metres high. First built in 1864 and it's been restored totally. Once was not enough for this person. Yeah! Well done. Woo! Yes. <laughs> That's how you get wiser as you get older. I don't know. Dairy, cattle, lean, antlers, velvet, sex potency supplement, raspberry, blackberry, gooseberry, With almost 40 million sheep, it is not surprising that New Zealand is known the world over for its lamb's meat and wool. Okay, see this here? It is all just skin. They have teeth on their lower jaw. Yeah, nothing, nothing on their upper. <laughs> and you can feel it on your fingers. Mm -hmm. Dairy products are also a large part of New Zealand export. Production costs are low, especially because cattle can be outside even in the winter. There are 5 million dairy cattle and 5 million beef cattle. Deer farming, which started about 30 years ago, has become a big export earner. As well as deer giving good lean meat, stag's antlers are exported to Asia as a sex potency supplement. Um, this is what we call a button, yeah. and, and so that has been cut off there. And the, so in the spring they fall off, 
And so when we cut the velvet, it is only 60, 60 days later. So it grows very fast. The best velvet this year sold for about $130 a kilogram. And my best stag actually cuts about 4.2 kilograms a year. New Zealand has an ideal climate for fruit growing. Large quantities of apples and pears are exported. Boysenberries, which are a cross between raspberries and blackberries, start to be picked just around Christmas time. Mm, I pay just beautiful, and with, together with cream or ice cream. Kiwi fruit was first introduced by the Chinese gold miners more than a hundred years ago. The fruit was called Chinese gooseberry. It was first grown commercially about 40 years ago and renamed kiwi fruit. So you can see now what kiwi fruit looks like when it's on the plant. Not so many years ago, this was sheep farming country. Now it produces some of the world's best white wines. Migrate, creatures, fur industry, currently, laden down. When people migrated to a new country, they did so to start a new and better life. They brought with them many plants and animals with the idea of starting to farm like they did back home. However, they did not consider the consequences of the effects on the balance of nature in their new country. New Zealand is a good example of this. As a result, many introduced plants and animals are giving huge problems today. One very good example is the Australian brush tail opossum. Now these little creatures are uh, introduced to New Zealand from Australia, brought here in the 1800s to establish a fur industry. What's happened is they've bred up into such big numbers, they now estimate there's over 70 million possums in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So we've got more possums than people and sheep put together. Currently they're doing a lot of damage here. They've worked out they're eating their way through something like 21,000 tonnes of our forest each night. That's the equivalent to a container ship sailing away from New Zealand each day laden down with leaves and berries. Mm. The government currently spends around $91 million a year on possum control in New Zealand, mainly through spreading a poison called 1080 poison. Pretty nasty stuff. Hydroelectricity. Agriculture. Farm stay. Hydroelectricity is New Zealand's main source of electricity. However, building of dams have given much public debate because of the impact big dams can have on nature. Steam that comes up from the ground under high pressure is also used to generate electricity. In the 1860s, New Zealand had its gold rush, just like America and Australia. Today, gold is still mined commercially in some places. Gold in small quantities can also still be found. The family of this jet boat driver mined gold here until 10 years ago. Now they live off tourism. So when the early gold miners came along, all they did was just pull it literally out of the bottom with their hands and the gold was just sitting there. All the way up here, it got 800 ounces right in this one spot here in one day. Now that doesn't seem that much gold, but it is a lot of gold. Today, instead of gold, one of New Zealand's main riches is its large areas of unspoiled nature which attracts more than three million tourists from all over the world every year. Most of New Zealand forests are temperate rainforests and not without reason. 
the most southwesterly part can get 7,000 millimeters of rain per year. Interest in agriculture attracts many tourists. More and more farmers are offering farm stays and a great variety of activities. Just on top of this one, 782 meters. Oh, 782, is it? 800 yeah. meters. Yeah, 800 meters more. That's 442 is this little knob here. These are the islands, Moto Tapu and Mo Wahu. Most of you will have heard of New Zealand in one way or another. This video will have given you some background on it in a visual form. Hopefully, it will motivate you to want to learn more about this unusually beautiful and fascinating country. It is not surprising that New Zealand film producer Peter Jackson found New Zealand an ideal location for filming the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. Many New Zealanders were involved in the production of this epic film. One example is Andrew Kolf. My name's Andrew Kolf. I'm um, a landscaper in Christchurch and I had the opportunity to uh, work on the building and construction and filming of um, Edoras here um, for the filming of The Lord of the Rings. We started here in April 2000 and when we first got here the only thing that, was, that had been done was that made the roads uh, to the bottom set. We'll finish off with some more New Zealand scenery while listening to Maori music in the background. <laughs> 